Bachin, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston Station, we are ready for the event. All right, National Institutes of Health, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call the station for a voice check. Wow, well this is Dr. Francis Collins, uh, Director of the National Institutes of Health, and I'm here on Earth uh, to have a conversation with Dr. Kate Rubens, astronaut and researcher, who's actually in space. And Kate, it is great to meet you via satellite. It is pretty fantastic, and we're actually bouncing off a satellite in low Earth orbit from the space station, sending that down to the planet and beaming that out to you guys. So uh, it's pretty incredible. <laughs> it is indeed incredible, and it seems to be working, which is just amazing. Well, you know, it's been 13 years uh, since I had the privilege of leading the Human Genome Project that read out that very first uh, reference sequence of the human genome. And now here we are rocketing forward, if you'll pardon the use of the word, uh, with lots of other advances that take advantage of our ability to read out DNA and RNA. And uh, you're up there in space uh, doing DNA sequencing for the first time. Here on Earth, uh, we're in the process of launching a project that will invite a million people to take part in an unprecedented study uh, to understand how DNA, as well as environmental experiences and health practices, lifestyle, diet, exercise, all of that plays out in human health and disease, something that's called the Precision Medicine Initiative. And I hope some of the people watching today will read more about that and think about signing up when we launch this in three or four months. But uh, Kate, if I may call you Kate, and please call me Francis, uh, really delighted to have a chance to hear about your experiences up there doing DNA sequencing uh, in zero gravity in space. Tell us a little bit about that experiment and how it's going. Yeah, this was truly an experiment in all senses of the word. We did not know if it was gonna work uh, the first time we were doing sequencing in space. And uh, like every lab experiment, uh, you put your pipetter down and you give it a try. And it actually was a fantastic technology demonstration uh, we have uh, bubbles and fluidic changes in microgravity, and we were able to show that we can successfully do sequencing in space, and we've uh, sequenced over a billion base pairs at this point. So we have this capability now in low Earth orbit. A billion base pairs already. That is pretty phenomenal. So that's like one third of a human genome. <laughs> And you're doing this on a DNA sequencing instrument that is extremely compact. Many of us who do DNA sequencing here on Earth, we use machines that are pretty good size, not quite the same as they used to be, but they still occupy a big chunk of lab bench space. Yours sounds like it's about the size of a thumb drive. It is, it's incredibly compact. And uh, that's one of the things that's a unique aspect of spaceflight is that we need to get machines to be compact, portable, robust, uh, independent of, of much power generation. We generate all of our power up here from solar rays. These are all the kinds of challenges that we faced when I was doing uh, Ebola and monkeypox experiments in Congo. Uh, so the kinds of things that we find in the most remote corners of the planet are some of the similar technologies and engineering advances that we're solving uh, by sending humans off of the planet. So tell me a little bit about what you might anticipate DNA sequencing would be used for uh, in space travel. What kinds of uh, organisms would you be looking to try to um, understand using this approach? So I'm a little bit biased because I'm a virologist uh, and uh, have studied genomics of <laughs> microbiome and immune system and viruses for a long time. But I do think that the microbiome of the space station is incredibly fascinating. We live in a closed loop environment here. Uh, so we recycle all of our air and all of our water. Uh, this being NASA, you can bet that every piece of equipment that comes off of the planet is incredibly well controlled and documented. The, uh, the fairly cooperative human subjects on the space station are well controlled and documented. Uh, so we actually have an excellent opportunity to study the microbiome of a closed loop system that's off the planet. 
I think we can also use this technology uh, when we're starting to look for signs of life in the solar system beyond the planet. And we can also start to understand human health and disease. Most of our disease research is taking a, a variable and looking at, at human physiology under different conditions. We have the opportunity to look at human physiology as it's floating here. Uh, so this is obviously quite a unique laboratory if I'm talking to you from the ceiling or the wall. <laughs> that was a nice demonstration. <laughs> so we've collected a few questions from social media and we'll also be taking a few live questions uh, and I'll be looking at them in a screen in front of me. And I see one here from Dieter Perkhofer, uh, who's asking, uh, maybe relevant to what you were just saying, is it possible to get the flu on the International Space Station? So that's actually one of the great things about being up here is that uh, all of the astronauts who launched to the space station, we have a couple of crew members who are launching in just a few days from Kazakhstan, are uh, quarantined and screened. So we, uh, we don't have the possibility to transmit a cold up here. Um, you certainly could have uh, other microbiological foodborne illness, uh, that kind of thing. But we, uh, we find that when we isolate humans uh, from other human beings, that's actually a very incredibly effective antiviral uh, transmission. So I want to ask you a few other things about the relationship uh, between space travel and uh, human health. And I'm happy to say that NIH and NASA have longstanding collaborations in this particular area. And we're excited about some of the things that are now possible. Uh, so, for instance, astronauts like you are up there exposed in many ways to various types of radiation that we don't get on planet Earth because of the protective shield of the atmosphere. Just yesterday, uh, Vice President Joe Biden, in announcing the latest plan for the cancer moonshot, uh, highlighted a partnership between NASA and NIH and other agencies, specifically looking at whether we could learn more about the effects of various types of radiation on human cells uh, by doing those experiments in places like the space station. I is that something that you could say something about? Is there, are any of those experiments going on right now? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's one of the, the microgravity environment and, and cells uh, floating is obviously an uh, incredibly interesting thing to study. But the radiation environment, I think, is the second major factor on the space station. We just can't simulate the low Earth orbit radiation environment on the Earth with uh, the beams and the accelerators that we have on Earth uh, don't give us the same uh, mix of particles that are currently bombarding human physiology in low Earth orbit. So we can study that up here. We have um, had long-standing partnerships with NIH to understand uh, what's going on with cell physiology on orbit. And we can study this at a cellular level we can grow cultured cells up here. We just grew cardiomyocytes uh, from programmed adult stem cells for 42 days uh, in orbit. And we can study rodent models. Uh, we can study humans as models. So we really have all of the tools at this point to understand uh, how radiation, DNA, damage, and uh, all the kinds of cellular stress that contribute to aging and cancer uh, we have some, a lot of tools to start to understand those in low Earth orbit. That's very impressive. I've been reading about the twin study that's going on right now, this unique opportunity to look at identical twins, uh, Scott and Mark Kelly, where Scott was in orbit for 340 days uh, while his identical twin, Mark, who's previously been an astronaut, uh, was here on Earth. And uh, I guess because Scott thought it was a good idea, a whole bunch of plans were made to see what would be the difference in their biology based upon that long time uh, that Scott spent in space with sort of the per perfect control here because he and his brother have exactly the same genomes. I know that work is ongoing right now, and I guess maybe we'll hear something in the coming months. But I thought that was a particularly interesting and creative way uh, to look at the effects uh, of what space travel might be like on an individual. Absolutely, and that allows you to look at both the genomic effects 
uh, as well as there's transcriptional studies, um, there's epigenomic studies going on as part of that, and there's complete environmental analysis as well. So understanding the influence of genes and in, in the environment, uh, we've got this very, very unique environment in space, um, but one of the benefits is that it's also incredibly well controlled, and so uh, we can understand uh, the, how human health and, and uh, genomic responses are influenced in this, uh, this very bizarre uh, place that we call orbiting our planet in low Earth orbit. So, Kate, you mentioned one of the applications of the DNA sequencer might be at some point to look and see if other life forms exist out there and could be characterized. But, of course, that raises the question, would those other life forms have DNA or would they have some other means of propagating information? Obviously, nobody knows the answer to that question, but you must have thought about it. Absolutely, and uh, one of the one of the interesting things about the technology that we're using, the nanopark technology, is that um, it can be uh, it it uh, can have some capabilities for uh, nucleic acids that are slightly modified. So you're really looking uh, at something that's got capability uh, potentially to analyze things that are nucleic acid-ish uh, that may, might not be exactly resembling a human DNA on the planet. And obviously we're going to use an, an entire suite of tools uh, when we are building our Mars missions. Uh, but to be able to test out microfluidics, uh, how these kinds of molecular biology tools work and function, and to do a lot of the troubleshooting on the space station in low Earth orbit as we're building our plans to go deeper into the solar system is an incredible capability. So I see a question uh, from Kokak Retrato about uh, what are the expected effects of gravity on sequencing, and I think you've mentioned something about the issue about the bubbles. Are there any other things that you would expect would be different about sequencing in space as opposed to on Earth? Yeah, luckily surface tension really works uh, in our favor here. And, and uh, the bubbles in space uh, issue, I don't. I, I think the best way is to show it. Uh, and I've got I've got a packet here, and you can see that that bubbles form in in our fluids here, and they form in a very odd way. Uh, and and just even understanding the fluidics and and the bubbles at a molecular biology scale is incredibly important in terms of other. In terms of other effects of gravity, uh, I think mostly that's going to be on cellular function, uh, how cells organize themselves in tissues, uh, how cells might behave in cell culture when they're no longer forced to the bottom of the plate. The actual molecular composition and analysis should be pretty similar assays to the planet. So Phoebe Kinzelman is asking along the lines of what you just mentioned, what's the main difference that you saw between the way heart cells interact in space rather than on Earth? Did that gravitational absence make a difference in how they clump together? Yeah, and that's, uh, that's what the researchers are looking at right now. So I think they are, they are writing a paper about this and are going to publish it soon. Uh, at least for me, analyzing the cell culture up here uh, is actually, uh, it's not stuck to a tissue culture plate. So the cells were allowed to build on top of each other and start to form three-dimensional structures. And this changes, uh, obviously, the changes the way the cells are going to interact when they don't have that constant force of gravity. So one of the things that we could see was how the cells organize themselves without gravity, uh, how they're communicating, and some of the cellular structure and dynamics. So that's very cool. Uh, NIH has a program on building tissue chips, where on a biochip you would have various cells that represent heart and lung and kidney and brain, all derived by the magic of stem cell biology, which has come so far so fast. And I know we have a plan to have those tissue chips up there in space and use them as ways of assessing what are some of these biological effects, as for instance, uh, that radiation might create in a way that doesn't actually do any harm to humans, but you can do a lot of measurement on those cells uh, sitting there on that chip. 
let me ask you, in terms of the DNA sequencer, uh, you know, because you're a very highly trained molecular biologist, that the sequencer needs fairly pure DNA in order to do its thing. There's this question in my mind then, how would you in space go about preparing the sample to get it ready for the sequencer? How would you identify the DNA in your environment, for instance, if you needed to? And that was uh, basically exactly my question before I launched. So we're allowed to fly a few things. And uh, one of the things I decided to fly was, uh, in my personal allocation, was a whole series of pipetters. So in my free time, I've been doing some experiments about how you would do library prep uh, and actually have found that uh, pipetting and the standard methods of moving things around in, in uh, Eppendorf tubes and uh, moving between a microliter and five microliters or 50 microliters works very well up here, which was extremely surprising to me. That was not my hypothesis. Uh, so I think the library prep is going to be very similar to what we see on Earth. It's just the input uh, is going to be incredibly different. So we can sample uh, human samples. We can sample from the environment. Uh, we can sample cells that are sent up, uh, any number of biological inputs. And we're going to be able to do, we're, wor we're working on that right now, uh, to be able to do some of the library prep to go right into the sequencer. That's pretty amazing. I guess I would have thought that without gravity, you'd have bits of material floating all around that you'd try to pipette and it would go down in the tube and then it wasn't there anymore. But surface tension comes to the rescue. Is that what, what makes it work? It absolutely does. And so it's very strange to, uh, to hold a reaction and pipette it just as you would on Earth and then be able to flip the tube upside down. Uh, and the, all of the liquid stays in there. So it is both identical to bench research on the planet and completely different. So Kate, you've had an amazing career already. I know you were a fellow at the Whitehead Institute, one of the most cutting edge places that does molecular biology. There's a question here uh, from the, uh, the live feed. Uh, what would you tell young students uh, about your experience with science? Because I hope a lot of them are watching. I think my grandkids are. I would tell them uh, to find something that they care a, a great deal about, something that they're incredibly passionate about. And uh, I have not particularly tried to go in any direction in my career. Um, I actually applied to be an astronaut while procrastinating a little bit on writing a R01 grant application. So I think I would say probably thank you um, directly because <laughs> I, uh, I have found myself in some extraordinary and unexpected places because I have done whatever seems to be the most fascinating, interesting, and compelling thing to do at that time. I love that answer, and that's certainly the answer I would give as well to people asking, how do I plan my life career? It means a lot of it is keeping yourself open uh, to unexpected opportunities. It sounds like being an astro astronaut was one of those uh, for you, and not expect that you can actually plan things out over many decades. Uh, things are changing too fast. There are too many exciting things happening in science. But if you have a passion to make a discovery, to make a difference in the world, to add to the knowledge of the universe. Science is a great place to be right now. Never been a better time than right now uh, to get engaged. So let me uh, ask, because I think we're probably getting n near the end of the time. Are there other things, Kate, that you wanted to be sure uh, to share with the people watching this about your experience up there? Well, I wanted to let folks know how amazing it is uh, that we're sending human beings into low Earth orbit. And I'm incredibly excited. You mentioned some of the NIH-NASA partnerships. Uh, the things that we are able to do right now are both fantastic for where we are uh, with launching human beings off the planet. We are just starting to send people into the solar system. I think as we look back on this in 50 years and 100 years, you're right. This is a very, very exciting time to be alive and to be involved in science and engineering and technology. And I also want to say that I think this is an incredibly exciting time for molecular biology and research. I think the places that we're going 
with uh, the world of sequencing, the world of starting to understand our microbiome and human health and disease are very, very exciting. And so I'm really looking forward to future opportunities to work uh, with NIH, with uh, academic researchers, and with NASA to explore all of these. Well, thank you, Kate. It's been great to talk with you. You deserve uh, our applause and our prayers. You're an inspiration to everybody. We'll be archiving this video for anybody who wants to view it later. And we look forward to Kate's safe return to Earth. Many thanks, everybody. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Collins and the National Institutes of Health. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications. <laughs>